This podcast is sponsored by CSMI, the maker of the Humac Norm Isokinetic System. Purchase a new or refurbished machine, or you can even upgrade an existing system to bring it up to date with all the latest testing and training applications. Please visit csmisolutions.com to view all of their available products, including the Humac Norm Isokinetic System, the Humac Balance, Portable Computerized Balance System, and Sportswear Online. CSMI. Better data leads to better results. The Everything PT Podcast is sponsored by Vald Performance. Vald is the creator of the airbands for blood flow restriction therapy. If you are looking to stay up to date with today's post-surgical modalities and adding BFR to your clinic, please visit valdperformance.com. Hello, and welcome to the Everything PT Podcast with Matt Taylor and Daniel Bodkin. Please do not consider anything you hear to be medical advice. Just a couple of guys ranting about everything PT. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Everything PT podcast. I am Daniel Bodkin. I'm with my Co-host Matthew Taylor. This is episode 24, Matt. Yes, yes. We just uh, keep churning out episodes and um, this is our third one today. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad and uh, to get back together and we just schedules have been tough. So I'm glad we can get to your man and do it. Hey, so great. You know what? Scheduling and fitting in when you, where you get in. That's kind of the topic of this one yeah. tonight too, because we have a very special guest with us. We have Sarah. Sarah, hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I know you as Sarah Bass. I know. You're no yes. longer Sarah Bass, right? I am no longer Sarah Bass. <laughs> yes. Sarah I'm, Anderson. I, well, it's actually Andreessen, oh, which is okay. very confusing yeah. for most people. <laughs> and I misspelled well, my wife that. never took my name. So, I mean, so people are like confused when they hear her, like, you know, real name versus like yeah. her social name. Yeah. It's just easier that way. I know. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, my, my doctorate degree has my maiden name on it. And sometimes I feel like I should have hyphenated, but, mm -hmm. I, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So everybody, back when I was an athletic training student, one of my rotations was with uh, John Hisamoto, who we had on a couple of weeks ago. And while I was there uh, as an athletic trainer, Sarah was there as an intern with the exercise science program at USF. And then we both knew we wanted to go the PT route. Sarah got in at South Florida. And I was like, yes, I know somebody here. And then she left. I did. She went to Florida. I did. <laughs> Florida was go. really fun. Yeah. Florida's outstanding PT school. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was honestly, it was great. Yeah, definitely. I don't think you made a bad choice there. And even if you stayed at USF, that was, you know, a great school as well. So <laughs> it was, I knew you were a little like trying to figure out what you wanted to do and, and whatnot. Yes. Yes. But, you know, not to date us or anything, but that was like 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. I was, I was finding myself, Danny. All right. So Sarah, I wanted you to come on because I'm all about having people with interesting practice, you know, um, niche practices. And you've definitely uh, made physical therapy your own. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, you know, what your current practice is and how you got to this? Okay. So my current practice, my practice is called Breakthrough Therapy and Wellness. And um, my specialization, my niche, niche, niche. I, I looked um, it up to see the correct way to pronounce it. Perfect. Now I know <laughs> niche. My niche is uh, vestibular therapy. And even more specifically, I have had a lot of success with um, migraine related dizziness. So I know we're going to talk about social media and stuff, but that's where I like really get ultra specific. So yeah, so vestibular therapy, I really, really, really wanted to open up a cash based practice, probably starting in like 2017, because I hated everything about what I was doing. 
clinical clinically. Um, at that time, I did not have a niche and I was stupid and I didn't start. I just like spent a good couple years listening to the cash based people, Aaron LeBauer and Jared Carter and all of them. Sure. And um, is it okay if I say names? Yeah, okay. sure. Um, <laughs> Look, let's be honest. <laughs> There's not that many people really listening to this. That's fine. I just want, I just want to We don't want to offend uh, Aaron Bauer. For for those of you who are listening, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your check's in the mail. (laughs) So I listened, something just fell outside. I'm sorry. I listened to them endlessly, read all their books, did all of that. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this when it's the right time. Well, the right time never comes. I had a baby. Um, I had another baby and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I got furloughed because I was just returning from um, maternity leave. Like literally the week I returned from maternity leave, COVID hit, I had dropped down an hour. So they were like, you got to go. Okay. So I was like, I'm going to do it. So I just opened up an LLC and was like, I am going to treat vestibular patients mobile. I was coming from a vestibular clinic, which I actually loved because it's Mm -hmm. all I was seeing was vestibular therapists. And it was like really questionably run, probably it was a physician owned clinic. I got to do whatever I wanted to do, had full support of the physicians, was probably not the most like legal situation, Mm -hmm. but it was great. I had so much experience working mm-hmm. with vestibular patients. And I was like, I'm, I, f- I feel ready now. Mm-hmm. I should have done it years before, but I felt ready at the time and I had no other option. So I quickly did all of the basic business stuff and launched on Instagram within like a couple weeks. And at that time I marketed myself as a mobile therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, who treated vestibular therapy. And I had like initial success coming out of COVID, especially like people didn't want to go to clinics. Um, And we can get more into this too, but dizzy people are very like skeptical of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So it was enticing and it worked out pretty well. Fantastic. Yeah. Very cool. Just a little... We've all three of us have like, you know, at one point said, you know, damn the man, we're going to do our own thing. Oh yeah. I could go on and on about that. Yeah, <laughs> It's really scary. It's terrible. Like, there is so much anxiety with it. Like, yeah. am I doing the right thing? Am I doing too much? Not enough. Where do I put my energy? Yeah. 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 You're absolutely right. Um, and just to follow up with that question, what about the transition from like mobile PT to the online Okay. PT kind of thing. I'm curious about that. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to continue rambling, but sorry. No, 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 no. But I wanted to stop because there is like a transition period. So I am a mother with multiple children and mm-hmm. um, my husband is not a physician. And so the mobile therapy was going well, but in order to put yourself in a car and go to somebody's house, you have to have somebody watching your children and childcare is very expensive. So the reality of things was I couldn't really do that full time because my husband's income could not completely carry us and pay for childcare. So yeah, I, it's expensive for one, let alone two, two then three. right. And so, you know, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I took a full-time job with a company, a healthcare, corporate healthcare organization here that I'd worked with PRN for years and um, took a full-time position and went back to acute care. And I was like, okay, I'm going to see people on the side in the evenings. Well, I very quickly moved from acute care to outpatient which was funny because I hadn't done outpatient probably since I had been with Danny at John. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to go there and I had to basically learn how to be a PT. And um, so that took up a lot of time. So needless to say, like my mobile clinics on the side were not, my mobile patients on the side were not happening. And um, then I got pregnant again and 
<laughs> I just was like surviving, right? And mm-hmm. so the telehealth part came about when I was on maternity leave, I was like, I cannot do this. And I tried to go back full time initially, but it just did not work out. So the deal I worked out with my husband was I'm going part time with this clinic and I still am with them part time and I'll probably stay with them part time. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm going to like go full on market myself telehealth. Like I'm going all in on telehealth because I still can't really pack up my two kids that I have home with me now and go do mobile therapy. Mm-hmm. Now the caveat is, is if somebody is local, I do still go to their house. Mm-hmm. They don't market it. So I'm marking pure telehealth. I have seen telehealth patients and I have had success. So I do feel comfortable saying I am a telehealth therapist. But the other thing is, is that it opens me up for all of Florida. So I was like, how do I get the most bang for my buck here? If I'm going going to go all in on this, I am cash-based. I am very specific as far as what I treat. So, you know, I was like, my, my, my net is small kind of, but, Mm -hmm. but if I market myself this way, I can bring on people from anywhere in Florida because the like we're limited to the states that we are licensed in, and I tried to find the workaround for getting in those like uh, compact states. Mm-hmm. BT compact, yeah. Oh yeah, I was like, I was like, I will get Smart. one of those licenses, and then I can treat. But you have to like live there, and there's like uh, they kind of regulate that. So yeah, so that is why I transitioned to pure telehealth. And I've just been like really, really, really hitting it hard. I have the re- I have to like regain traction because I went silent for a while. So I'm basically, you know, starting over, kind of like we were talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you had like a brick and mortar, like you have to you have to start over if you go silent. So that's yeah. where I am right now. So, you know, I have a question about how you, you know, how do the patients learn about you? How are, how are you marketing? Through Instagram. Okay. That's it. That's all I have time for. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't have time to like tinker around with all the social sites. I have a Facebook page. I haven't done anything with it. Sometimes people leave stuff on there and I don't even know how to get to it anymore, honestly. But um, yeah, all through Instagram. And then nice. word of mouth, but, but mm-hmm. I would say 99% is Instagram. Yeah. I see a lot of your posts and what is it called? Reels? Reels. Like, yeah, I, somebody Damn. told me like, oh, you got to do that. And I was like, oh man, that's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it <laughs> is a lot of work, but I, I take the path of least resistance and yeah, I do the simple stuff consistently, but yeah. Reels are where it's at. (laughs) Looking for a way to improve sport specific training with your athletes? Then you have to check out BlazePods. BlazePods is a neurocognitive reaction training intervention that can be incorporated into your sessions for patients throughout the treatment spectrum. Visit blazepod.com, enter code EverythingPT at checkout and save 15% off your order today. Hey all you rehab specialists out there, Do you have an isokinetic dynamometer just sitting around your clinic not being used? Little known fact, isokinetic machines that aren't used regularly are at higher risk for bouts of sadness. Help your machine out and take CSMI's newest CEU course, Isokinetics 101 Online, created by me, Daniel Bodkin, and learn how to use all the exercise and testing applications available on your machine. With new and exciting rehab techniques in your toolbox, your sad isokinetic machine can become an active member of the rehab team again and regain its happiness. Isokinetics 101 Online by CSMI has been approved for eight credit hours for athletic trainers, physical therapists, and physical therapy assistants. Contact your state board for details on specific requirements. This course is available at humacnorm.com slash courses slash isokinetics 101. It's, it's really hard to do telehealth, like even for somebody's shoulder, it's hard to, you know, program, you know, just, you know, you know, teaching them what to do, trying to walk them through special tests or movement patterns or heck, just even getting them to figure out how to turn their volume on. 
right? yeah <laughs> i can imagine that that yes. with yes. Cheating, balance vertigo migraine that it's even more difficult uh in levels well you know honestly i think that it's probably easier than treating orthopedics if i'm being if like i already said honestly but so with dizzy patients patients with imbalance a lot of what they need and a a lot of what you need from them is all subjective Mm -hmm. like there's just such a huge subjective component with this population that telehealth is almost i don't know if i want to say better but i don't know like and you, you have the time constraints that you, the therapist put on the session. Mm-hmm. So if you have all the time in the world to like, let these people tell you every single thing that they're feeling and you are able to do like really, really, really good interviewing, you can collect like 90% mm-hmm. of the information that you need in order to then guide them down treatments and whatnot. Um, and yeah, you know, like talking people, like I've, I've treated a couple people for BPPV through telehealth, which is going to be the most ultimate difficult thing that you're going to mm-hmm. do for somebody on telehealth, as far as the vestibular population goes. And you just have to like slow down. You have, it, it, it makes you a great communicator. You have to slow mm, down yeah. and you have to give like very concise, easy to understand instructions and it always helps if they have somebody there with them. Mm-hmm. But as long as you know the right questions to ask and, uh, and you know what answers you're looking for, it's, it's surprisingly successful. Good. So it's, you know what it is? As a, as a PT, we think that we're so important. <laughs> and we think that we have to like put our hands on people. And we think that like <laughs> we are the ones doing the thing, right? But they don't really like, they don't really need us. They just mm-hmm. need somebody to listen and they need someone to educate them and to like guide them through what they need to do. You have to give safety precautions and all of that goodness, but yeah. Just to, to jump in, Sarah. So mm-hmm. I do some the stimulus stuff as well. Uh-huh. We see a lot of BBBV. I'm blown away that, doctors don't treat it in the, in the clinic still, oh, but again, I'm so right. Well. Right. We get it from ENT. So it's, um, it's, a, yeah. it's crazy. But anyway, we see them and I, I think I'm just like, um, you know, I just, I can't believe that these, these docs aren't seeing these patients. And so for the Epley maneuver, what kind of precautions are you, you providing? This is just strictly a clinical question. Like, are yeah. you, because I've heard a lot of people say, okay, you can't lay down. You got to sleep semi-reclined for a while. Um, I'd send to retest them real, real quickly and, and do the Dick's Hall Pike on them. And if it's negative, I feel like they should be able to kind of stay upright for a little while, but yeah. go back to doing what they need to do. And um, so the research, and I cannot pull a research study out of my back pocket, mm-hmm. but I, I know that the research says that the precautions are kind of like, not necessary anymore they used to put people in soft collars like oh wow the people I work with I hope I they don't listen to this but like if it was up to them they'd probably still put people in soft collars Mm -hmm. afterwards but um yeah I still like to give people so like you said after I do whatever maneuver I do I recheck every time unless they're like sick as a dog or their anxiety is just Mm -hmm. through the roof and this is this is my experience more so in the clinic. Um, so I will retest and I make them retest on telehealth too, but uh, retest if they're positive again, I'll put them through the maneuver again. I don't do that more than three times. And then I give them the precautions to follow for two days. And they are sleep with two pillows, uh, don't move your head quickly. And I tell them like, don't put your head up and hold it there. Like you're washing your hair or gargling. And I just tell them to do that for two days. Just, 
just because, you know, we're PTs and we don't always trust the research, Mm -hmm. but it gives, it also gives the patients like a little bit of control over their, their treatment and their progress. So like, you know, when people have to come back to me a week later, if it doesn't stick, then they're like, oh, I moved, I moved my head around too much or I slept. Oh, that's the other one. Don't mm-hmm. sleep on the side that I treat. That's the big one. Mm-hmm. Don't sleep on the side that I treat d- two pillows and avoid looking up. Um, but yeah, it gives them a little control and they're like, oh, I did this. I won't do that again. Like whether it really matters or not, that's gotcha. what I do. For, for cautions, so yeah. One more clinical question, just because I we see a lot of vestibular patients here, and it's not every day I get a, you know, a, a specialist to talk about it. Um, you ever get doctors giving patients a sheet of paper saying like, do X, Y, and Z, and then you get the patient and they're they're actually a little worse. Oh see. yeah, I see yes. that a lot to be honest. Oh, Being a generalist and do, yeah. seeing a lot of different stuff. They give. Oh gosh, they get, so they give like the old, like Brant Doroff exercise. Brant Doroff, yeah. Is that what they are? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're like, I've been doing it and I'm just throwing up all the time. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This might not even be BPV, BPPV either. And I find mm. that a lot is that I get these people, they're coming in to be repositioned and they don't yeah. have, they don't have BPPV, but unfortunately mm-hmm. their ENT or their, you know, urgent care was too lazy to like actually figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, my huge pet peeve, and you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you coming Please. from, coming from acute care and I worked in an inpatient rehab facility. So there, there's not as much, they're, they're not as at fault, but in acute care, these people come into the emergency room with spinning vertigo, throwing up, whatever. I mean, their anxiety is through the roof. Like, why is there not a physical therapist in the emergency room for mm. many reasons, but to yeah. test for BPPV? Because mm. they put these patients through a full cardiac workup, a full neurological workup, yep. and tra- like, oh my gosh, hun- like hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes they even admit them and then they tell them that is nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with them and they send them home and they say nah, follow up with an ENT and then they go to an ENT who like this is literally their job literally their job and they do whatever they do and they tell them that they have BPPV and say oh it'll go away on its own you can go yeah, to a physical they'll therapy give them, uh, they'll what? give them medication and Holy yeah crap. prescription and meclizine why are they not treating them? Yeah. Oh. I mean, well, you already have them back in the Epley maneuver. You already have them there. Like I literally <laughs> pull people back into what it was. <laughs> they uh, pull people back into a Dick's Hollow Pike. Yeah, hey. And if they're positive on that side, I'm treating them before yeah. I even test the other side. <laughs> yeah. It's not that hard. Like yeah. it's just, you're there. It's mm-hmm. very easy, but I don't know. I know phys- I'm not generalizing, but I am generalizing. Yeah are so freaking lazy and in their in in you know to play devil's advocate their volume has to be very high yeah yeah the healthcare burden's kind they, of been thrown on the physician have, or even, yes. why don't they have a pt just you know in-house yes danny yeah. I've thought for a long time that the, the ER could really use yes. the, the, the mm-hmm. just the guidance and professional opinion of a physical therapist yeah uh, when it comes to splinting Yes. Uh, you know, um, serious mus- MSK stuff, vestibular, you bring up a great point too. So yeah, the list continues. That was going to be the, that's what the, I don't know, the charge I was going to try to lead when I went back to work full time. I was going to try to like make an ER position for myself, but then <laughs> yeah. it opened up and I was sick of working on weekends. So I was like, well, <laughs> oh, I'll yeah. that for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, let's talk about the family side of it, right? Okay. How, how old are your kids? I have a five-year-old daughter, a two-year-old son, and a almost eight-month oh, wow. son. Yeah. Yeah, Busy. Are five and three and a half. Oh, man, it's tough. It, it's great when they get into kindergarten. Yes, except that we're sending our daughter to private school, and oh. um, i <laughs> just, like, still trying to figure out who's paying for that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we were in daycare. Uh, we had, you know, the two of them in daycare. Yes. 
she's finally going to school and some of our you know people we know they'd say oh are you going to send her to the the private school or the public and we're like public school like i know you're in georgia though right free no, we're in atlanta we're in yeah. North atlanta the public schools are better there right yeah they're really good oh uh, we have Absolutely. some of our best friends live in marietta and so their daughter oh. goes to public school like right yeah, across it's just a town away house. yeah and our public schools are garbage so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. so another question um for you sarah do you feel like um you know i love seeing you and Daniel like turn your side hustles into like just morph it into what you do pretty much and that's it's awesome do you feel I feel like our our field needs more of that I feel like that needs to be encouraged can you kind of speak to that and the freedom it's kind of given you and in, in your life yeah so I would kind of I was actually thinking about this earlier and I would I would say that I actually operate like multiple side hustles like I don't at, at this stage, I don't even have like a main thing. My, my clinical job is probably like my least thing, but I think just ha- like coming from that perspective where I have my, my private practice and I have designated very specific evening hours that I take patients and some weekend hours. And then I have very specific hours that I'm at the clinic. And then I have another, another thing that, um, kind of like fills in the gap. It seems very busy, but it gives me a lot more freedom because I am not handcuffed to one place all day long. And not only that, but it allows me to make income from a variety of different Mm -hmm. places. So I don't feel like I'm getting screwed over by corporate healthcare and it's just making mm-hmm. me like a miserable person and yeah. however much money I make on my other two things my my private practice and my we'll call it a coaching business um that's up to me so mm-hmm. yeah. if I can put in the work and I can make the money then that like I've done that so I don't know I don't know if that answers your question but it does. It, yeah like just just the 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 mental part of not relying solely on my corporate job to provide me income that feels like freedom totally (laughs) yeah i'm the same way you know i have my you know it's more personal training for people who started out with injuries and they just you know stayed on but then you know i teach i do uh we do the podcast uh, i install isokinetic machines a few times a month uh, I make education for them. So I have like four or five different buckets and yes. there might be some times where, Hey, I'm, you know, leaning more and I'm biasing this one more. And there's times where I'm not doing that one much. Yes. But even um, like the teaching job that I have through the university, that's going away. Uh, so I was like, you know what, what if I, you know, to keep myself in the clinic world, you know, pick up a floater position Yeah. where, you know, I can, I can set my own hours um, when I'm able to work and then I'm not even tied into any one clinic. I can, you know, if this clinic here, you know, calls me and they need help that day and it might be a different one Mm -hmm. next time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't always have to be, I'm only going to do, you know, one side hustle. You can give you a lot of freedom. And then the thing you don't even think about is saving money. So the fact that I'm, I'm not spending money, um, having my yard mode. Yeah, I'm not spending money having somebody you know clean the house, yeah. um, you know all that, or you know having a nanny, like yeah. all that, and it's you don't think about that when you're in the mix of it and you're trying to figure out your financials, but you're like, you know what, I am, you know the somebody called it like a, a domestic management or a domestic uh, yeah. CEO or something like that, but that really does play a role because it's a lot of time spent you know on the family side that you're providing that and you're not having to spend money on. Exactly. And it doesn't, there's not as much burden because I don't know, when you're working constantly for somebody else Mm -hmm. and having to spend all of that money on all that domestic stuff, it just all feels like a burden. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's exhausting but it doesn't feel so much like a burden because it's your choice to yep. take care of all that stuff. So I, I don't have kids and I have chased after the hustle and it is my full-time thing and taking out 
a loan and a huge chunk of our savings, lots invested. But um, I think the future is, is, I don't know if it's this, what we're doing here, you know, at Capital PT. I think it's more like what you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, and that gives you guys so much schedule flexibility without investing your life savings and yeah. taking out a, a huge loan, you know, that you're in, you're incurring so much risk on um, because you do feel that fulfillment. Like, Hey, this is, this is something my name is behind. I feel good mm. about this. And I, this is a good thing I'm doing. And these dollars, I have earned these. And that feels really good yeah. at the end of the day. So I think we're going to, I hope we see more of that because our field desperately needs it. Yeah. I think. This stuff needs to be talked about in like the actual PT programs. Like that's something that I would like to do is go to the local, like, oh Nova yeah, in the area. USF is in the area. Like somebody needs to go and talk to these kids about like what career options there mm -hmm. are and the possibilities. Yeah. Because like they should all be doing this out of school, at least on the side. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, all of them are way better at the internet than we are. Like they don't <laughs> well, even have to learn it. They don't even they, have to make it. They need to be good, become good clinicians first yeah. too, and yeah. then get yeah. comfortable. Yeah. You know, how many reps did you get in um, vestibular before you went and did your own thing? You're right. You're a right. lot. A lot. Oh, same God. with me. Say I'm I same with know. me. You're you know, right. it's a process and it's not about being right or wrong because these kids, they need to, you're right. They need to know they this information. Need know. They need to yeah. be exposed to it because yeah. that would, what happens is there's competition and our field grows and gets better because yes. it has yes. to, because it has and to. And we get way more respect um, yeah. outside of corporate healthcare. So yeah. if you are doing your own thing and you have a, a brick and mortar private practice, right? Like, I bet you have way more respect from your patients and even maybe the, your referrals. Do you use in, insurance? Do you get referrals from physicians and whatnot? Uh, unfortunately we do. Yes. Okay. So, but like, I, I can guarantee you that you get more respect for your position as are you a doctorate? I'm asking all these questions. I'm assuming. Do you have I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I have a, a so, DP. Yeah. So Dr. Taylor at his clinic, you have more respect than anybody working in a corporate race clinic. Like my patients think that I'm literally a personal trainer and I have <laughs> many letters behind my name and nobody cares. Yeah. And, um, and that's just because that. That is just how the way things are. Like nobody goes by doctor and mm -hmm. no PTs go by doctor because there's other PTs that aren't doctors. So don't mm -hmm. you dare call yourself a doctor and then confuse the <laughs> patients. You wouldn't want to confuse the patients. Oh my or God. upset the physicians. Uh, oh yes. No, don't upset. I've done them. that. I did that my first year real good once. <laughs> That's all right. You know what? They need to be upset sometimes. It's okay. Um, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, if like, if we kind of like lead, lead the pack on people starting their own, like, especially niche, niche, niche yeah. uh, practices, we're going to set ourselves apart and then maybe, maybe one day get as much respect as chiropractors. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. 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 Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you one thing about, um, Cairo and dentistry specifically, they are yes. room to be business owners. They are exactly. groomed to be business people. So we are groomed to be um, employees. Yes. Definitely. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with being a good employee too, there's if that's what you is. Wrong with that. Right. For sure. But um, I, yeah. And I think that's why we have gotten just bent over a barrel with insurance that you guys um, are, you might have some well, idea, Sarah, yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on with everything. Yeah. Another 4% cut with Medicare is coming in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, how uh, do we even survive? Like, honestly, yeah. how do they expect like you get triple booked for... and, you know, see more patients and work more hours, I guess, I guess that's the I answer. Don't I don't know. But, um, I think the more we talk, that's part of the point of our, our podcast, Sarah, you know, as we're trying to bring up issues like this, we're trying to educate new grads. We want to be a part of the solution and not just, you know, piss and moan about it and be, <laughs> If we do complain, I complain a lot, but, but I think this is good. We want to see you do well 
And um, so we, we want to share your story with everyone too. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank yeah, you. I had no idea how common it was for people to have these niche practices and mm -hmm. going off on their going rogue, you know, I had no idea. And then we started doing this podcast and we were like, inter you know, meeting different clinicians and like hearing how they've found their way to practice. It's just, it's really cool and eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah. No doubt about it. So um, your Instagram is, is doing well. You have any tips or tricks for starting you know, yeah. your, your very specific practice If someone is out there listening and they're like, man, I'm just going to tear it up after I hear this podcast. Yes. <laughs> so, um, my best advice for Instagram and probably any social platform is to just like do it messy, just start and, um, don't be concerned about things looking right or, just don't, don't get too detailed. Um, consistency is very important. And so like, if you notice on my social platforms right now, at some point, Instagram said that reels are like what you need to do. I actually pref prefer doing short form video because I have like no artistic capabilities and like, I <laughs> make a pretty grid. It's just, I hate it. So, um, I am only doing reels and I'll get in my story sometimes too. And I'm just committing to posting, I would say every day, but let's be realistic. It's like six, six days a week and, um, provide value. So mm -hmm. whatever your, your niche is just provide value and just put stuff out there, show your face, talk. So people get to know you, you know, sales lesson, nobody like people are buying you. There's, there's a, plenty of other people that do what you do in some kind of capacity. Like if they're going to purchase from you, whatever your product is, it's you that they are purchasing. It's you mm -hmm. that they want. So you have to show yourself, you have to show your face, you have to show your personality. You have to be very authentic and um, you just have to do it. And it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Anybody that you see who has been very successful on Instagram has done the dirty work that nobody was watching and they were pumping out content where like three people saw it and it sucked. And then eventually it's the compound effect. You keep doing it, you stay consistent and it eventually it compounds on itself. And then all of a sudden you're successful and you know, people are like, well, I want to, I need to do what she's doing mm -hmm. so that I can get there and you will get there. It just takes a while. So be patient, be consistent and show your face, give value. Those and have fun with hard. it. What was that? You have fun with it. You look yes. like you're having fun when you're, yes. <laughs> when you're making your posts. Well, you might as well, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a very serious person. So nah. I like to laugh. And so I just try to be as relatable as possible because <laughs> then people are a lot more forgiving when you suck. <laughs> yeah. Makes you, makes you likable when you yeah, have yeah, humility exactly. too, which is important. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. All right, Matt, do you have anything else? I think that's all I have for you, Sarah. That, thank right. you so much for coming on our podcast. Yes. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And I told Matt, this is my first podcast, so. Oh, yeah. You guys, like, I'll remember you forever, so. <laughs> you should, when you blow up, you remember there me and Daniel. always okay? times where one of us is, like, struggling to find, like, time to record. It would be really helpful to have somebody to step in and help out every once in a while. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Never know. Well, I was actually, when we, when we, whatever, people will want to hear this. When we were going to go off air, I was going to say, hey, you guys, because podcast, like, that's my, like, next, that's my next yeah. like, side gig. I have, I have a couple different ideas, but um, I was going to, like, employ you guys as my coaches one day. Yeah. We, know some people, we know some people who could help you, I think. Okay, awesome. Oh, I don't yeah. really have the time to give it <laughs> that I need to right now, but... Yeah that's next in the um the funnel so it's actually literally started out because matt saw it at a acsm or combined okay. sections 
And he, yes. so he got into it and he's like, Hey, you want to do it? Maybe it'll be, you know, drive people to his website through like yes. the SEO content. And then he, he literally just asked people like big names. Hey, we have a podcast. You want to come on? And they said, yes, he just reached out and people would say, people yes, love it. They love podcasting because again, yeah. it's an opportunity to show your personality and to just mm-hmm. have like yeah. a conversation with somebody you don't have like I do have like a fake outfit on I have like (laughs) a solid shirt so it's not distracting but I totally have gym clothes on underneath um (laughs) but you don't have to get my the point saying like you don't have to get like so serious and all formal Mm -hmm. no because it feels very intimate you can just kind of go off the cuff so then you know you can be likable you can be yourself it's huge so even like big people they love doing this because it is just it's it's way better for sales yeah like, oh yeah well, converts prof- so much better so. professionals i mean well educated tend to be smart you know mm-hmm. especially when it comes to business i mean it only helps drive search engine optimization daniel and i have met incredible people in the That's last awesome. uh, i don't know four or five months in doing mm-hmm. this that we we definitely do not deserve to meet or even be in the same oh, room. Oh, please. Yes, you do. No, I'm you serious. I'm serious. Because you were brave to reach out yeah. to them and be like, hey, I am nobody. Do you want to do this? So you do <laughs> deserve it. I appreciate that. But, um, and now we have a few sponsors. We make a little bit That's from awesome. it just because we've asked some people, hey, we use your product already. We'd love it. It's awesome. We naturally yeah. are going to talk about it. Are you interested in being a sponsor? And they're like, yeah, sure. Why Perfect. not? So um, it just makes a, makes a lot of sense, and and I I genuinely enjoy you know meeting people like you who are like minded. I kind of feel like my my I feels my spirit a little bit too. So Absolutely. yeah, it's just nothing but but good. If we mm-hmm. scheduling can be the hardest part, getting yeah. on yeah, schedules. Of course, I encourage well, you to to look said, into it. Thank just you. Just like you said with Instagram, you just have to start and be consistent yeah. and. It starts out, you might have, you know, a few views, but you know, as you kind of slowly pick up and then it yeah. kind of builds. Yeah. And it, like, you're never going to be perfect at anything when you first start. No. So yeah, you just, you just have to start somewhere. And like I said, do it messy and it'll get better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just don't be scared to start. I think. Right. Yeah. Yes. Good. Well, thanks for coming on, Sarah. Um, yes. Yeah. I appreciate it. I know Daniel does. Daniel, mm-hmm. we've had some great guests today, man. It's been a yeah. it's been a great day. Yeah, over the last three weeks, we've had great guests. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> but we didn't all record all these in the same day. I promise. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> good. All right. So until next time, uh, we will see everyone uh, next week. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>